it's worth reminding ourselves that the last residential school closed in 1996, which is a mere 25 years ago. Of course, still being in the midst of a global pandemic reminds us about the importance of land. And myself as an immigrant settler to this country, an immigrant whose ancestors came from India, which underwent partition under colonial rule and resulted in the mass migration, the biggest mass migration in history, I'm immensely grateful to be on this land, the land upon which I have the privilege to live and work. While we're all joining from different parts of the province today, I'm going to speak about the land upon which the CPSO offices sit, so 80 College Street. And most importantly, I'm going to speak about what acknowledging the land compels me to do, what it compels me to do to action true reconciliation as a physician, as a parent, as part of this organization, an organization which strives to be accountable, respectful, responsive, and communicate with compassion. So as we acknowledge the territory, I invite you to reflect on the land upon which you have the opportunity to live and work. And if you're not aware upon whose land you live and work, as I've said before, I very much encourage you to find that out. And this is a great resource here um, that can be used. So this is the traditional territory of many nations, including the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Anishinaabek, the Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee and the Wendat peoples. The land is covered by Treaty 13 with the Mississaugas of the Credit. And while acknowledging the territory is very welcome, it's only a very small and preliminary part of cultivating strong relationships with First Peoples of Canada. Acknowledging territory and First Peoples should take place within the larger context of genuine and ongoing work to forge real understanding and to challenge the legacies of colonialism. Those legacies exist today. We are part of those legacies as healthcare professionals, as a regulatory body, and they exhibit themselves in many forms, not least differential healthcare outcomes. We're well aware of the dispro disproportionate number of Indigenous people, as well as Black and racialized folks who've been affected by COVID-19. And last year, the In Plain Sight report, which I encourage you to read if you haven't already, revealed disturbing results about the depth and breadth of anti-Indigenous racism in healthcare and called us once again as regulators to action. Today, Takaronto, which is a Mohawk word meaning the place in the water where the trees are standing, is home to First Nations, Métis and Inuit people from across Turtle Island. Despite ongoing oppression, Indigenous cultures and languages are still thriving and we have much to learn from this. The recent vaccine rollout for Indigenous communities is an excellent example of this partnership with Indigenous leadership and organizations has resulted in a high level of vaccine confidence and a high rate of immunization. The Truth and Reconciliation Commission made clear that reconciliation is the responsibility of every Canadian, each and every one of us. And I would argue as the regulator of physicians with a mandate to protect the public of Ontario through right touch regulation, we're tasked with ensuring that we have accountability to all those we serve not just those whose privilege is the greatest and whose voices are the loudest. As an organization, you know that we are working diligently to better understand our role as a regulator in systemic racism and other types of discrimination. The Federation of Medical Regulators of Canada has released documents calling on all regulators to examine our governance, policies, complaints process and training on anti-racism and anti-oppression. And we have to keep asking ourselves the hard questions about what needs to be done and how we can embed this into every part of our strategic plan. This is a big task, but one which I know as committee members, as council members, people who hold decision making power in this organization that you all take seriously. Many of us, all of our front facing staff, and I know many of you as committee members and council members have completed the Sanyas Indigenous Cultural Safety Training. And one thing I was particularly struck by in that training was the description of the two row wampum by an Indigenous leader. He spoke of the belt showing two parallel paths, Indigenous peoples and settlers traveling together down the river of life, not interfering with each other, but also pledging to do right by one another. The relationship that underscored the treaties was supposed to be one of peace, friendship and respect. 
The parallel lines signified that the journey does not end, and there was an understanding that the relationship would be revisited frequently. Us settlers did not hold up our end of the bargain, but we have the opportunity to do that now. We are all responsible for this work. And finally, as I was reminded very recently by an Indigenous leader in a video that was shared by a colleague, as settlers, we often forget during a land acknowledgement to actually thank the land, to acknowledge the very ground upon which we step every day. In my culture, we have a spiritual connection to the land as well, with deities representing earth, fire, water and wind to whom we pray. So to end, I'd like to share the words of my eight year old son with his permission. He wrote this at school last week. Dear nature, thank you for the water I drink and the trees that give me shade. Thank you for the peaceful sound of water flowing. Every night I look at the sunset over the lake and it's very relaxing. We don't have this view in our house, so I think this is maybe in his mind. Um, I love the sound that the cicadas make and the fur of the caterpillars. I love the heat of the sun on my back. Thank you for rain puddles.